Now, having described here the apostasy that was coming and the apostates that would come into the church, what can believers do? What can believers do in days like these that we are living in today? Now, he mentions here, beginning with verse 20 through 23, he mentions seven things that believers can do in days like these. The first one, and I'm reading verse 20, but ye, beloved. Now, you see again, he's talking to the believers, those beloved of God, but ye, beloved. Now, what can we do today? Well, number one, but ye, beloved, Number one, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, building up yourself on your most holy faith means the study of the Word of God. And I just have the notion that since God gave 66 books, that he meant that we're to study all 66 of them, not John 3.16 all the time, or John 14. How many Bible classes go back and over the same teaching? They teach John. They teach Romans. And oh my, they'll get to Revelation. I guarantee you that. But what about the other 63 books that are in the Bible? Why don't we study them? Why don't we study all of it? Because, my friend, if you're going to build yourself up in your most holy faith, you must have the total Word of God. You can't build a house without a foundation. And when you get the foundation down, you're going to need to put up some timbers there that are going to hold a roof. And you're going to need a roof on it. You're going to need a side on it. You're going to need to fix it up on the inside. And you need all 66 books of the Bible if you're going to build yourself up in your most holy faith. Now, that's what we're to do in days of apostasy. Now, we've already seen this, and I'll merely refer to it. Paul and Peter urged that in the last days you're to study the Word of God. Now, you will recall that both Paul and Peter, Paul in his swan song, which happens to be Second Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You are to study, and that all scriptures given by inspiration of God. In other words, the recourse that you and I have as a child of God in these days is the word of God. And the reason that many fall by the wayside today is because the seed fell among stones. It didn't get deep root. What does that mean? The Word of God is the seed. My friend, unless you study all the Word of God, get down in the good, rich soil, you're not going to become a very healthy-looking plant. And it won't be long until you'll be walked down and the sun will burn you out because of the fact that you can't stand up and especially in days like these. Now, Peter, in his second epistle, and he's writing of the apostasy, just as Paul did, and he says there that we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise, in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Don't just pull out one or two little verses and think you got it, my friends. That is, I think, the tragedy in Bible study today is drawing out a few verses here and a few verses there, and you build a system. Why not take it all? It always reminds me of Lincoln when he was having his portrait painted. The artist kept definitely shifting Lincoln around so that wart on his face wouldn't show. And finally, after he got him adjusted so the wart wouldn't show, he said, Now, Mr. Lincoln, how do you want me to paint you? And Mr. Lincoln said, Paint me just as I am, wart and all. And certainly there's part of the Word of God that you're not going to like. It steps on your toes. Many people say, I step on their toes. I don't step on anybody's toes. The Word of God steps on your toes. 
And people don't like that part. My friend, today we're to build up ourselves in our most holy faith. That's what we're enjoined to do in days of apostasy. And that's the reason that we've got one purpose today in the through the Bible, just to teach the Word of God. We're not promoting anything else but the Word of God. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. It's the faith. It's not your own personal faith, but it is the faith, the body of truth that has been given to us in the Word of God. It was called there in the first of Acts when the first church came into existence. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. That's the faith, that body of truth that has come down to us in the Word of God. Now, we must build ourselves up in that if we're to stand. And the second thing that he mentions here is praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. And you will note also that this is an unusual phrase. Actually, it occurs only one other time in the Scripture, and that is over in the epistle to the Ephesians. And you'll recall there that when he mentions putting on the armor of God, everything is for defense with the exception of two items. And one of the offensive weapons is, he says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And the first one that we were to do was to take the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. And you can see that follows along here. First, we're to build ourselves up in the faith. And I think that we need a little sword drill, you know. The Word of God is the sword. You've got to have training. I recall that back in Texas many years ago at Dallas, a very fine man there by the name of Mr. Will Hawkins. He had the radio revival. And I do not know of any program during the Depression and afterward that ever influenced people more in that area than that program did. I'm told that one of those very wealthy Texas oil men worth many millions, that's the first thing he did every morning was to get up and have a cup of coffee and listen to this man's program. I don't know that he ever did anything for it that amounted to anything. I really don't think he did, but he listened to the program as it went out. Now, one of the things he did on his program was have what he called a sword drill. And that was a test of the knowledge of the Word of God. And I thought it was about the best way that it could be used. Now, the first thing is to have sword drill, to listen to God first before he has to listen to us, because we can say a lot of foolish things. So, first of all, we are to take the sword of the Spirit, but we need to build ourselves up in the faith. We should learn to use that sword. And then the second thing is praying in the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that in Ephesians here. It's part of the offensive equipment that we have in the Christian life to overcome. Now, praying in the Holy Spirit, I think, is a little different than handing in a grocery list to God about what we want. A great many things that we talk about, we want, we want, gimme, gimme, gimme is the way our prayers go. And don't misunderstand, petition, as it's called in theology, is part of prayer. But how about praise? How about worship? Our prayer should be an adoration and praise to Almighty God. I think probably I ought to tell what the president of the Western Baptist Seminary, Dr. Rodmacher, told me one time. He was given the prayer meeting in one of the churches there, and it would have been pretty dead. It was like most prayer meetings in most churches. That's the deadest part of the service, of course, is the prayer meeting. And it ought not to be. It ought to be a real powerhouse. But unfortunately, it's not. So he announced the first night. He says, now tonight... We're not going to have any prayer requests. We're just going to spend the time in prayer praising God for what he's done for us and thank him for what he's done for us. And he said, you know, we had the briefest prayer meeting that night, you could imagine. It's amazing how many things we can ask God for. It's amazing how few things we can thank him for. 
and how little of praise goes up to him. Have you thanked him for this day? Well, it's a glorious day in California, (laughs) and I thank him for it. I hope you are having a glorious day. Oh, just have a good day and thank him for it. That is the thing that we need to do today. And prayer has in it just more than excitement and exultation. I think prayer is a real ministry and also a ministry that is not easy. Paul said to the Romans, you remember, he asked them that they pray for him, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And that's Romans 15, 30. And in that passage, the word strive is agonize. At least we get our word agonize from that. We're to pray like that. And then Paul again says in Romans 8, verse 26, "...likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered." So that you and I today do not actually know what to pray for. We're like a little child. My grandson can ask for more things that he shouldn't have than any little fellow I've ever met. I take him with me to the store sometimes, and he wants everything that he shouldn't have. And I think sometimes, well, my, that's the way I pray. Just like a little child, I say, Lord, give me this. I want that. Give me that. And he doesn't do it. Why? Because I'm not praying in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. Now, we need to learn to do that. A missionary in Venezuela sent me many years ago a little card on which it gave a definition of prayer. It says, prayer is the Holy Spirit speaking in the believer through Christ to the Father. And friends, that's a very good definition of prayer, by the way. We need today to learn to pray. No wonder the disciples, having heard the Lord Jesus pray and their little paltry prayers, they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Many of us need that. But there's very little instruction today about learning how to pray. 